would tantalize explorers for hundreds of years. Ruined cities lost in the jungles of Central America and Mexico. Inscrutable faces etched in stone. Mysterious writing. Who had left these messages from the past? It would take more than a century to unlock the secrets of the ancient Maya. Two extraordinary people would lead the way. Separated by a hundred years, they would unveil one of the greatest mysteries of archaeology. Stevens wanders the empty ruins, looking for clues. He knows what he wants to find. It has kept him going through two harrowing journeys, exploring the desolate jungles of Central America. kept him pushing on through mud and malaria, poisonous snakes, and insect played nights under the stars. Stevens, the lawyer, was looking for proof, undeniable evidence that these ruins were not built by the Egyptians or the Phoenicians or the lost tribes of Israel. And here, at Chichen Itza, he thinks that he's found it at last. Writing unlike that of any other civilization he knows. The same writing he'd seen at other ruined cities, hundreds of miles away. Proof of an ancient empire of Native Americans, more sophisticated than anyone believed possible. Stevens himself was a product of the New World. He was born in 1805, the son of a wealthy New York merchant. The city wasn't much more than a Dutch village, but it was the hub of a new nation. Stevens grew up along the Hudson River, watching the ships come in from around the world. After reading law, he opened a practice on Wall Street. Soon he got into politics, campaigning vigorously for Andrew Jackson for president. But months of shouting to the crowds gave him a serious throat infection. His doctor prescribed a common remedy for wealthy young men, a grand tour of Europe. The ancient ruins of Italy and Greece only piqued his curiosity. Stevens went on to Egypt and spent three months floating up the Nile, visiting the temples and monuments along the way. Only a decade before, a Frenchman had deciphered the hieroglyphs, revealing the rich history of Egypt's kings and queens.
Stevens was fascinated, and he still wasn't ready to go home. He'd seen pictures of a fantastic ancient city in Arabia, lost for centuries to all but the Bedouins. Everyone told him the journey was too perilous for an unaccompanied American. So Stevens disguised himself as a Turkish merchant and took the name Abdel Hassis. In 1836, John Lloyd Stevens was the first American to set eyes on the ruins of Petra. In Roman times, it had been one of the greatest cities of the East. Stevens still found it dazzling. A temple, delicate and limpid, carved like a cameo from a solid mountain wall. The first view of that superb facade must produce an effect which will never pass away. Stephen's letters home were so vivid and imaginative, they were published in a monthly magazine. Soon, he was writing books, recounting his exotic adventures around the world. The lawyer had become a literary sensation. He was a, a seasoned observer. He was an incredible observer. In fact, Herman Melville uh, of Moby Dick fame uh, re recalled one time when he was in church, Herman Melville was, uh, he was a kid. Uh, he had heard that Stevens was in the front row. And when Stevens left, Melville writes, uh, I, I thought this man must have great huge eyes that bulged from his head. He was such a good observer because Melville had read his stuff. Back in New York, the life of a sedentary lawyer no longer held any charm for Stevens. Instead, his mind was filled with thoughts of another journey. Not so far away, but even more remote and daring. On his way home through London, he'd met an artist named Frederick Catherwood, who'd spent 10 years in the Near East. They shared their interests in exotic travel. Sensing a kindred spirit, Catherwood had showed him a curious book about a lost city in Central America, hidden in the jungle. The book's authors thought the fabulous ruins of Palenque had been built by Egyptians, Carthaginians, maybe even the lost tribes of Israel, anyone but the Native Americans. There was kind of a racism in here that said that everything great had come through the Greeks and the Egyptians, through the European tradition, and anything different uh, appeared in, in relatively to be a bunch of naked savages wandering through the woods. In 1839, no one believed the Native Americans capable of building a sophisticated civilization. Stephen's own government had little use for them. Only a year earlier, they'd uprooted thousands of Indians, sending them westward along the infamous Trail of Tears. The thought of a great ancient civilization in Central America seemed even more preposterous. A few travelers had reported sighting ruined cities like Palenque, but Stevens could find none of them on the map. It was a travel writer's dream. Only this time, he'd have to bring back evidence of whatever he found. But who better to accompany him than the artist Frederick Catherwood, now practicing architecture in New York. Only one small problem remained the newly formed Central American Federation was fighting a bitter civil war. Using his political connections, Stevens secured a post as a confidential agent. He figured his diplomatic coat would protect them in dangerous territory.
So in October 1839, Catherwood had bid farewell to his wife and two young boys. And now they were here, deep in the jungles of Central America. The ruins of Copan was their first goal. But when they found the little village with the same name, no one there had ever heard of nearby ruins. Finally, a knowledgeable Indian offered to guide them. But that was hours ago. Now they were beginning to think that the ruins were nothing but a legend. When suddenly, there they were, grander than their wildest dreams, the ruins of Copan. Pyramids rose majestically out of the jungle. Great stone faces peered at them from intricately carved monuments twice the size of a man. Stevens noticed hieroglyphs and judged them to be as fine as any he'd seen in Egypt. Yet his experience told him that these carvings were unique. The silence of the once majestic city overwhelmed him. Copan lay before us like a shattered bark in the midst of the ocean, her masts gone, her crew perished, and none to tell whence she came. I think the, the description of Copan is the single most poetic description of, of a place he visits, for it is though he is walking around in, inside the Titanic, and he's looking at the shipwreck of a civilization. He walks from monument to monument, and it's as though he's looking into the faces of those who have recently been ruling this place. America, say historians, was peopled by savages. But savages never reared these structures. Savages never carved these stones. Architecture, sculpture, and painting all the arts which embellished life had flourished in this overgrown forest. And yet none knew that such things had been or could tell of their past existence. He's the first who really is able to say, look at these stone figures. These must be portraits of their kings and queens. And he uses the word queen, which is really quite astonishing uh, in seeing men and women in the monuments for 100 years later. All the men and women that Stevens saw will have been reduced by 20th century archaeologists to a group of anonymous calendar priests. Stevens has this kind of Yankee can-do observation, and the best part of many of Stevens' insights is that they prove to be absolutely true. Yet Stevens was deeply puzzled by the mystery at the heart of Copan. Who could have built this extraordinary city? The local Indians didn't seem to know. Stevens needed their help to explore the ruins, but the owner of the land interfered. Finally, it seemed that the only solution was to buy Copan. So the lawyer put on his diplomatic coat and went to the village to negotiate. You are perhaps curious to know how old ruins sell in Central America. I paid $50 for Copan. There was never any difficulty about price. I offered that sum, for which Don Jose Maria thought me only a fool. If I had offered more, he would probably have considered me something worse. Ownership settled, the team set about surveying the ruined city measuring and mapping its buildings. Catherwood is a remarkable character as well. I wish we knew more about him. 
one gains some sense of the Stevens personality just from the written word. The Catherwood personality doesn't emerge much. Stevens treats him very formally, and he appears as Mr. Catherwood. At first, Mr. Catherwood found it almost impossible to draw the monuments. Their tropical luxuriance defied his restrained British hand. Stevens mentions coming upon him in the, in the woods one day. Catherwood's standing in front of a big upright monument. It's a statue of one of the, the Copan rulers, and all intricately carved, and, and Catherwood's standing there almost obscured by a pile of crumpled paper, which represents the output so far that day of unsuccessful attempts to draw this thing. Fortunately, Catherwood had brought along a camera lucida, a box with a prism inside, which allowed him to trace a reflected image. To please the perfectionist Mr. Catherwood, every detail had to be correct. With the coming of spring, they were ready to begin the search for their next great goal, Palenque. The territory to the north, through the Sierra Madre Mountains, was wild and uncharted. As one local said, the roads to Palenque were only for birds. Snakes and clouds of mosquitoes dogged their steps. To Stevens, the worst part was the local custom of carrying a visitor up the steepest trails on a chair strapped to the back of an Indian. I rose and fell with every breath, felt his body trembling under me and his knees seemed giving way. The slightest irregular movement on my part might bring us both down together. I would have given him a release for the rest of the journey to be off his back. that had first inspired their journey. Palenque seemed to hang on the edge of the mountains, its graceful buildings dominating the plain below. Wherever we moved, we saw the evidences of their taste their skill in arts, their wealth and power. In the midst of desolation and ruin, we looked back to the past, cleared away the gloomy forest, and fancied every building perfect, lofty and imposing. Palenque's architecture was different from Copan's, but Stevens noticed many similarities particularly the mysterious writing. Examining it carefully, he reached a remarkable conclusion. There is room for the belief that the whole of this country was once occupied by the same race, speaking the same language, or at least having the same written characters. The Indians Stevens met spoke many languages and were as mystified by the ruins as he was. Yet intuitively, Stevens seemed to sense a link between them. Stevens, I think, is the first person who can make the connection between the Indians that he, he sees and meets 
and the ancient ruins. Whereas other people want to say, oh, these pathetic peasants, these miserable Indians, they could never have built this. We must look for some alternative solution to where these things would have come from. He believes that there's complete continuity. And that, I think, is one of the most radical ideas to come out of his book. At night, Stevens and Catherwood slept in the imposing ruin they called the palace. The rainy season had begun, and the mosquitoes, venomous during the day, were even worse at night. Catherwood was already racked with malaria. But somehow they kept on working. For 22 days and sleepless nights, bewitched by the beauty of Palenque. Exhausted, they pushed on further north and east to the Yucatan. But Catherwood was too ill to continue. Vowing to return, they headed home to New York. In 10 months, the two explorers had accomplished the impossible. They'd rediscovered an ancient American civilization grander than anyone had ever dreamed. Now they were ready to astound the world with its story. Stevens's book was incredibly popular when it appeared in uh, the summer of 1841. Incidents of travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan. Harper and Brothers had printed up a, a goodly print run, and it sold out pretty quickly. Stevens writes a real page turner. It's, it's such a personal view. And it becomes one of the great bestsellers of the entire 19th century. It goes through dozens of editions, and there's an enormous American desire to know more about this part of the world. They were lionized after the publication. They were the, quite the thing in New York. And uh, this, this, it was reviewed everywhere, and uh, just an amazing you know, publication epic. So uh, the trip was a success, and they planned to go again. Seventeen months after they left Mexico, Stevens and Catherwood were back in the Yucatan, exploring the city of Uxmal. On this second journey, they concentrated their efforts on this one region of Mexico. Inching their way through the jungle, they discovered many ruined cities entirely unknown, with names like Caba, Labna, and Sail. Stevens felt they were racing against time. Everywhere they went, they found ruins collapsing into piles of rubble. Catherwood even learned how to sketch from his mule to save time. At Izamal, the artist drew the face of a god on the side of a pyramid. Years later, it was destroyed. Catherwood's illustration is our only record of it. They performed the greatest service, perhaps, in, in freezing in time a set of observations and images of a land that no longer exists. They're romantic pictures, yet at the same time, they're remarkably accurate. Many of Catherwood's renderings, for example, of the Maya at Ushmal and at Labna and other sites are the first depictions that we have of what Maya people looked like. We have no earlier record. In the town of Boldenchen, the explorers visited an ancient well deep underground. Catherwood was so inspired he began his memorable sketch at the foot of the ladder. It was the wildest setting that can be conceived. 
Men struggling up the huge ladder with earthen jars of water strapped to back and head, their sweating bodies glistening under the light of the pine torches. One of the last places they explored was Chichen Itza. Its architecture moved them more than any other city on this second journey. Most exciting of all was the revelation that this city had been linked to Copan and Palenque, hundreds of miles away. It was the first time in Yucatan that we had found hieroglyphics sculptured on stone, which beyond all question bore the same type with those at Copan and Palenque. If one could but read it. Finally, Stevens felt he had the proof he'd been looking for. The mysterious writing was unique, unlike any he'd ever seen. Now, he could convince the skeptics that the ruined cities had been built by Native Americans. These ruins are different from the works of any other known people, of a new order. They stand alone. In the nine months of their second journey, Stevens and Catherwood managed to visit 44 ruined cities and gather some treasures for an exhibition on their return. But they paid a heavy price for their adventures. Malaria would haunt both men for the rest of their lives. John Lloyd Stevens would fight the dread disease for 10 years before succumbing to it in 1852. Frederick Catherwood would die tragically a few years later in a shipwreck. This is the only image we have of him. For there was another sad chapter to their story, the fate of the great exhibition they held on their return to New York. This fire started one night in July of 1842 and literally overnight wiped out the physical originals, the, the drawings, some of the archeological stuff, the limestone carvings that they had brought back at great labor thank goodness for the books. And I thank the fates every day that somebody at Harper and Brothers Publishers in New York had the foresight to heavily illustrate the book because what a shame if the drawings had been lost. Fortunately, before he died, Catherwood issued exquisite folios of some of the drawings. They inspired generations of explorers to follow the intrepid pair to the land of the Maya. But Stephen's insights would have a different fate. His greatest intuition that the Maya had written the real stories of their lives on their monuments would be ignored. The legions of archaeologists who came after him were able to decipher some of the glyphs but only those that spoke of numbers, dates, and the stars. Carried away by the discovery that the ancient Maya were great astronomers, archeologists fashioned a picture of them as peaceful stargazers, obsessed with calendars and time. John Lloyd Stevens had looked at the monuments, he had seen real kings and queens. A hundred years later, archaeologists saw only the calculations of anonymous timekeepers. It would take a fresh set of eyes to finally unravel the secrets of Maya carving 
and prove that Stevens was right. The story of Tatyana Proskuryakov is not well known to people outside the realm of Maya studies. Yet in that field, she is a giant, a woman in a man's world who saw further and deeper than her more famous contemporaries. What we know of the ancient Maya today, the exciting revelations emerging from dozens of excavations is built on her work. Speaking of Copan, she was the first to describe its ruins as a puzzle. And she was the one who supplied the missing piece. Tatiana, or Tanya as her friends called her, was born in Tomsk, Siberia in 1909. Her mother, the daughter of a prominent general, was a physician, her father a chemist. World War I shattered their peaceful existence. In 1915, Tanya's father was sent to the United States to supervise arms manufacturing for the Tsar. With the coming of the Russian Revolution, the family was trapped and began a new life in suburban Philadelphia. At work on the first biography of Proskuryakov, Shar Solomon has been uncovering these early details of her life. Tanya's story is compelling to me because she was born in Russia at such a tumultuous time. She came to the United States. She, she acquired English as a second language and, and mastered it in such a way that it became the equivalent of her first language. She chose a profession that was dominated by men at a time when many women did not choose to go that route. Tanya majored in architecture at Pennsylvania State University, one of the only women to do so in her graduating class. It was 1930, the height of the Great Depression. Tanya spent several dispiriting years looking for work, then settled for a job making drawings for a needlepoint shop. The search for good subjects led her to the Archaeological Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. Tanya's skillful drawings attracted the attention of Linton Satterthwaite, an archaeologist looking for an artist to work at his dig deep in the jungles of Guatemala. The ruined city of Piedras Negras was a big jump from her close-knit Russian family. But Tanya was ready for an adventure. The small party set off for Guatemala in the winter of 1936. On their way, they stopped at Palenque, the graceful ruined city that had captivated the explorers Stevens and Catherwood almost a hundred years before. Tanya was equally entranced. She, in older years, said that when she first saw the elegant little Temple of the Sun, she knew she had found her vocation, that there would never be anything else that would get her as much as that. Tanya's pencil responded easily to the intricacies of Maya art. The young Russian-American had felt the pulse of an ancient mystery. But settling into Piedras Negras wasn't easy. Tanya had to learn how to survey and draw the dilapidated ruins. As an outsider, as a woman who had learned a profession and trying to find a way into it, I'm sure she was clearly, uh, you know, little Tanya, 
allowed to sit there with her, her drafting pen and make observations about Piedras Negras. I think she had to pay for every step she took, but she really, I think, was someone who was able to compete effectively with the boys. In Maya archaeology in the 1930s, the boys were a pretty formidable bunch. This was a group of people that came together, people from mostly Ivy League and, and uh, Harvard and, and uh, Penn and, and other places that were all close friends. They were all, as most archaeologists were at the time, people of independent means. They could do what they darn well pleased. Even in the bush, these silver spoon archaeologists managed to live well. At Piedras Negras, dinner was a formal occasion, beginning with cocktails. Somewhere around five o'clock, they would dress, and they would dress elegantly. Tanya had a white dress, full-length dress, that she packed along with her, and she would slough through the mud to get to the dining hut, and then sort of tuck the muddy bottom of her dress down behind her feet so that no one would notice. a little bit of challenging banter also between Tanya and Linton. Uh, he had, had suggested that one of the structures did not have a staircase going up one side. And she felt strongly that there would have been and challenged him on that point. And so he said, well, if you really believe that there was a staircase there, then you'll have to dig and find me the proof, which she did. And to her delight, she found the staircase. Tanya began to sketch reconstructions of the ruins based on the archaeological data. Her drawings were so impressive, they earned her a sketching tour of other Maya cities. Her first stop was Copan. Noted Mayanist Ian Graham shared an office with Tanya in her later years at Harvard's Peabody Museum. He remembers her tales of Copan in the 30s. Anyway, she landed the sole female in, in this um, isolated camp. And there were some fairly spirited characters there. One was an amazing man called Gus Stromsvik. Gustav Stromsvik, uh, the Norwegian archaeologist who worked for the Carnegie Institution, fell deeply in love with her. And Tanya had a period in which she tried to decide what this relationship was going to mean in her life. Stromsvik was uh, a very dynamic personality. He was very outgoing. He was a raconteur, and she loved people who could tell good stories. She loved to laugh. So she was drawn to him, but on the other hand, Stromsvik had a very serious drinking problem. Um, particularly on Saturday nights, the life there was pretty wild. Tanya seemed to handle it perfectly well. It's amazing. She led such a protected life in her Russian family and in her suburban life in Philadelphia. But she had, uh, she had grit. Tanya's next stop was Chichen Itza, center of the Maya world in this golden age of archaeology. The ancient city was undergoing a renaissance as archaeologists from the Carnegie Institution pieced it back together. Careful rebuilding has gone hand in hand with the work of rebuilding. Welcoming the throngs of visitors was the man who would serve as the spokesman for the Maya for more than 20 years, Carnegie's Sylvanus Morley, known for his oversized straw hat and ebullient personality. At 
At Chichen Itza, he lived in grand style in a Spanish colonial manor house. Every evening, a Chinese cook would prepare dinner for Morley and his band of archaeologists. Envious colleagues referred to them as the club. On special evenings, Morley would lead his guests to the ruins of the Maya ball court for a concert, amplified by the court's amazing acoustics. Tanya would join the others in the moonlight, in this fitting place to conjure the spirits of the departed Maya. For to the Carnegie Club, the Maya were a band of priestly stargazers, unlike any other people who had ever lived. These ancient wise men had never fought wars. Instead, they had spent their time inventing an elaborate calendar and a system of writing used for nothing but recording time. The author of this view of the Maya was Sir Eric Thompson, an acerbic Englishman whose intellect dominated Maya studies for nearly 50 years. No one, not even Morley, questioned his authority. As Thompson began to formulate his ideas, no one had the strength of character to resist. Morley was the one who tried. In Morley's early works, he offers a rather different picture. He is overwhelmed by Thompson's point of view and adopts it. This makes it very difficult for a new voice to find a path, and particularly when one can imagine that the name of Tanya is probably generally preceded by Little. Thompson may have been able to cow the other members of the Carnegie Club, but he hadn't bargained on Tanya Praskuryakov. My general sense of her is absolutely contrary in a kind of way that uh, if you said, well, it looks like rain, she'd say, oh, there's not a drop of rain in that cloud. She was the kind of person, if you said, oh, it's too warm in here, she would immediately go turn up the thermostat uh, and make it a little warmer. She just had a kind of contrary personality. And I think that helped her um, also then say, well, if you say the Maya are peaceful, let's look at them from another point of view. Bit by bit, Tanya began to ask different questions than her colleagues. She also started to study the living Maya, convinced that they had something to teach her as well. When she was in Highlands, Chiapas, she took some lessons learning how to weave on the hand loom that the Maya work with. And at the same time, the same young woman was helping her learn Maya. This is something a lot of people don't know about Tanya, is that she did study Yucatec Maya. Tanya's intuition that the living Maya could provide a valuable link to the past was borne out by a fabulous discovery in 1946. An American filmmaker named Giles Healy persuaded a Maya Indian to show him one of their secret places. The Indian led Healy to Bonampak, a lost city buried in the jungle. Peering into a building, Healy was astounded to find faces looking back at him from the walls. Armies were locked in a furious battle. Other scenes showed prisoners of war and victims of human sacrifice. Try as Thompson might, it was impossible to convince anyone, I think, that these depicted a peaceful Maya. For in the Bonampak murals, we see one of the greatest battle paintings ever created in the history of humankind. Perskuryakov had not been allowed to write a single interpretive word on the Bonampak paintings. 
but I've always wondered whether it did not play some role in shaping how she looked at the Maya world. Sir Eric Thompson effectively barred the door at Bonampak, preventing other Mayanists from pursuing the bloody implications of its murals. Nevertheless, the flaws were beginning to show in his vision of the peaceful Maya. A few years later, another piece of the puzzle would slide into place. In a bookstore in Mexico, Tanya found a revolutionary new book by a Russian named Yuri Konorosov. Always interested in things Russian, she avidly read his new theory of Maya writing. Eventually, it would prove the key to deciphering the glyphs. But for years, Sir Eric Thompson would condemn the new theory as communist propaganda. In the late 1950s, Carnegie closed down its Mesoamerica program, a victim of new priorities. But Tanya was kept on as a research associate with an office at Harvard's Peabody Museum. Her days in the field were over, but her greatest work had just begun. In her little apartment in Cambridge, Tanya was on to something. In reading through Tanya's diaries, I can see that in the 1950s, she made a very conscious decision to become more uh, private in her life. She began working much more intensely with the hieroglyphics. In her mind, Tanya had returned to Piedras Negras, the site of her first experience with the Maya. Puzzling over the monuments, she noticed a peculiar pattern in the glyphs. Over and over, the same glyphs were linked to dates. And on each of the monuments, none of the dates exceeded a human lifespan. Suddenly, to Tanya, the evidence was clear. The monuments were marking the stages of an individual's life. Where others had seen only cold calculations, Tanya Praskuryakov saw the lives of human beings. It was a conclusion that cut to the heart of everything Sir Eric Thompson believed. Tanya marshaled her facts then showed Thompson her article before sending it to the publisher. And when she talked with him about it before he had read it, he disagreed strongly with what her ideas of the Maya were. When he took the article home and he read it, he came back the next day and said, well, actually, I believe you're right, which were very big words from someone who was considered a giant in the field at the time. And from that time on, when you saw a Maya monument, you knew that it didn't deal with gods and priests, it dealt with human beings. And that was the importance. In one sense, everything that we've done since then in epigraphy and in the interpretation of the hieroglyphs has been a footnote to what Tanya did. She did the general breakthrough. And when she and Yuri Konorosov in Russia uh, came up with the hieroglyphic keys, uh, that was it. We went on a roll. Once the code breakers went to work, a more human image of the Maya began to emerge. Written on the monuments were the stories of their lives, their ancestors, their battles and conquests. Across the centuries, the Maya came alive. Kings and queens, rulers of fabulous cities, full of the voices of people echoing out of the past. Things are changing at such a dramatic rate. We can read about, I would guess, um, 75, 80% of the inscriptions that the Maya wrote. And given that in 1960, we could barely re read any of it, um, that's extraordinary. 
David Stewart began deciphering Maya glyphs when he was just a boy. Tanya Praskuryakov is one of his heroes. He met her shortly before she died, when she was continuing her careful scholarship at the Peabody. In 1998, Stewart took her ashes to Piedras Negras for burial, at a site high above the ancient city she had loved. We didn't really realize how poignant the ceremony was going to be. Most of us were students or uh, young people in the field, in our 30s at the oldest, and it sort of dawned on everyone that here was the, you know, the remains of this great lioness, this legendary figure. The, the Guatemalans who were there were very emotional about this because this was the woman who had brought the Maya back to history. At the end of his pioneering journey to Central America in 1840, the explorer John Lloyd Stevens had been the first to state with conviction. One thing I believe, that its history is graven on its monuments. More than a hundred years later, we finally knew that Stevens was right. At Palenque, Kupan, Chichen Itza, and dozens of ruins in between. The ancient Maya now speak for themselves. Thank you.